screen is yours. Thanks. So thank you all uh, very much for uh, surviving the first uh, eight talks. And I hope that you will survive the last one as well. So first I would like to, to clarify an issue about the organizer of this uh, summer school. So uh, Galit and Janos, they thank the organizers, but who are those organizers? So I don't think the webpage says anything about it. So actually this is a, a joint uh, teamwork of uh, Miklos and all the speakers, including Janos and Galit, thanks and bells. So uh, uh, everything did, everyone did his part uh, in, the, in the organization and uh, the, this uh, summer school came up to be. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. And for me, all, uh, all this started, and actually this, uh, this summer school as well, I think uh, it started in, uh, just before uh, the COVID started in, gen in January or December uh, 2020, it was, or many years ago uh, before the COVID, um, when Janos visited Tel Aviv and suggested to work on, uh, on games with general payoff functions. That is Borel games. Okay. And I thought uh, I work usually uh, with uh, pair of functions, which are the limit of the averages. Those games are difficult. So I thought that uh, with general pair functions, nothing can be said. But uh, OK, I mean, Janos, you know him. He's very sweet. So uh, why not uh, work on what he suggests? And then uh, the, the COVID came into our life. We had plenty of time. And uh, this very difficult, seemingly very difficult uh, topic, uh, I mean, we had time to crack some uh, problems. You've seen the presentations of Galit and Janos this morning, uh, some results that we uh, could have done. And uh, now those two, uh, those two uh, results are uh, new papers. So uh, uh, the, the paper that Janos uh, presented with countably many players was uh, just submitted. The paper with uh, the paper, the first paper on regularity and its implications was not yet even submitted. So everything is really fresh from the oven. And uh, this uh, result that I will uh, present now is also uh, very, very new. So uh, what we have, uh, what we've seen so far uh, is essentially today, we've seen games, repeated games with tail measurable payoffs and bounded and Borel measurable. But the main, uh, the main property that we needed was that payoffs are tail measurable. So Galit presented repeated games with finitely many players, uh, finitely many actions. Uh, and uh, we proved that uh, for every epsilon, there is an uh, epsilon equilibrium together with uh, a fork theorem. And Janos uh, showed us how to extend this result to countably many players. Uh, we also saw uh, the example by, uh, by uh, Gurenfeld about uh, a counter example, a game with countably many players without uh, epsilon uh, equilibria, um, since the, 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 the payoffs are not tail measurable. And, uh, a very uh, uh, basic open problem is what happens when the number of players is finite, but the pair of functions are not tail measurable. So drop the assumption of tail measurability and then ask whether an epsilon equilibrium exists. So this is an, an uh, open problem. And uh, even if the pair of function is the limit of the average payoff, the long run average payoff, even then when there are at least four players, um, or even at least uh, and even three players and even two players. Uh, we do not know uh, whether an, an epsilon equilibrium exists, but when the limits are, the, when the payoffs are the limit, are the long run average payoffs for four players, it is an open problem whether there is an equilibrium and uh, epsilon equilibrium. So in a very simple case. So essentially this is an open problem and therefore uh, uh, it's not, uh, it is difficult. So it's not clear whether we can do anything yet about it, but uh, 
as, uh, as we've seen in the first two talks today, then something can be said. But I will uh, try to, uh, to weaken the assumption of tail measurability. And today I will show you one class of gains with, without tail measurable payoffs where we know that an epsilon equilibrium exists. I have a question. Yes. I have not been able to listen to all the talks, but I'm a bit surprised by this notion of countably many players. Is there any game theory where one considers uh, uncountably many players? Yes. So there are games with a continuum of players. Uh, so uh, if you think about uh, markets with uh, continuum of, uh, of consumers, uh, then you can, uh, or with many, many uh, consumers, then uh, sometimes you model it by continuum of players. Uh, there are models of uh, matching when you have continuum of, of uh, players who you match to each other. So there are various models with continuum of uh, players. But it's rather, rather uh, countable versus continuous, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Yes, but, but, but there is also the general uh, infinitely many players with uh, uh, continuity assumptions. So we put the right topology and uh, th that's already, I think, in Pell expert paper. I, I'm not sure it needed to be countable. It could be any infinite number. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. so uh, before uh, diving into the, into the uh, or in the class of games uh, I would like uh, uh, to present today, I want to uh, refer to a question that I think Dietmar uh, mentioned, which was, uh, what about subimperfect perfect epsilon equilibrium? Uh, and actually Janos in his talk yesterday already mentioned that there is a Borel game without subgame perfect epsilon equilibrium. And it was uh, presented in this uh, paper with uh, seven, seven uh, authors. Uh, so uh, a paper with, uh, with Janos and uh, I, I wouldn't uh, try to pronounce the Dutch names uh, because I'm sure I will make mistakes. But anyway, the, this is the spelling. And this is a two player alternating move game. Uh, each player has two moves. And the move is simply to choose the active player tomorrow. So the game starts with, uh, with player one as the active player in stage zero. And then in each period, the active player chooses who will be active tomorrow. Will it be himself or herself or whether it will be the other player? So, and then uh, the outcome, the, the infinite path would be an infinite sequence of active players. The identity of the players who is active in every period. And the payoff to each players, to each player, the F function is, uh, depends on this infinite uh, sequence. So if player one is active from some stage and on, then the outcome is minus one for player one and two for player two. If the active player for, from some stage and on is player two, then the payoff is minus two to player one and one to player two. And if the players keep on changing activity, who is the active player infinitely often, then the outcome is zero to both. So this is the game. Now, the payoffs in this game are not tail measurable because it is very important what happens in the first uh, period. Um, and then uh, this game does not have an epsilon equilibrium. Okay. And why is that? Because uh, suppose that in, uh, the play is such that the equilibrium play is such that both player keep on switching who is active on the equilibrium path. In that case, the payoff will be zero. But then player two would like to be active because if he's active always, he gets one. So player two 
will, uh, will at some point will not pass activity to player one, but uh, rather will keep the activity uh, to himself and get one. But then the payoff to player one will be minus two. And then player one will not uh, prefers to be the only active player because then she gets minus one. So that player one will never uh, let player two be the active player. She will be the active player always. So in every subgame in which player one is the active player in the first period, player one will remain always active. So now consider a subgame where player two is the, act, is the active player in the first period. Now player two knows that, uh, that, uh, that uh, if she passes uh, the uh, activity to player one, then she will get two. Whereas if she keeps the activity for herself, she will get one. So she will pass the activity to player two. Uh, sorry, she, uh, so, so player two will pass the activity to player one and she will get two. So the only uh, equilibrium possible is that player one keeps on being active always and player two, if she happens to, in every sub game in which she has the activity, she will pass it to player one. But then player one will not want to be active because if she is active, she gets minus one. Whereas if she keeps on passing the, the activity to player two, then activity will switch or will keep on moving from player one to two to one to two and the payoff will be zero. So this is why in that game, there is no uh, subgame perfect epsilon equilibrium. So this is a variation of an older game uh, presented by Nicola Vieille and myself, but essentially uh, this game uh, is a very nice game showing that subgame perfect epsilon equilibrium need not exist when payoffs are non-tail measurable. What happens if payoffs are tail measurable? I don't know. Janos, do you have an idea? No, okay. So this is an open problem. Okay, so now once we uh, remove the issue of, uh, of uh, subgame perfect epsilon equilibrium, we concentrate on epsilon equilibrium. And uh, uh, here I would like to present a known game, the big match that was uh, presented by Dean Gillette in 1957 and then solved by Blackwell and Ferguson in 1968. So the big match is a two player zero sum game, repeated game, where each player has two actions. Player one, top and bottom, and player two, left and right. And we have stage payoffs. The stage payoffs, U of the action of player one and the action of player two appear in this matrix. So if player, so this is a, a matching tennis game. Okay, so player uh, two, or, uh, player one wants to match the action of player two or the other way around. However, there, this, is, this will not be a repeated matching tennis, but there will be uh, a difference. And this is the difference. So denote by T star, the first stage in which player one plays B. So in this game, player one uh, plays T for some periods, and then at some period, at some stage, player one will play B, maybe never. But at some stage, T star, uh, she, player one, plays B. And then the payoff, which is a Borel function of the whole play, is given by, if T star is finite, so that if player two ever, so if player one ever played B, the payoff will be the stage payoff at that stage in which player one played B. So if at that stage T star, player one, sorry, player two play left, then the outcome will be one. Player two will play one dollar to player one. If in that period in which player one played B, 
player two plays right, then the outcome will be zero. So the outcome in the all game, the infinite game, will be that payoff in that's in the terminal stage, T star, when player one played B. Now, what happens if player one always plays T? In that case, we take the limit, the long run average stage payoff as given by the actions of player two. Okay, so we calculate the average, the long run average of those zeros and ones that will uh, obtain uh, along the play. Okay. So this is the payoff function of the big match. So that we remember that those entries are terminal. Once they are played, once they are chosen, the game terminates and the payoff is determined in the infinite game. I write here stars. So those two asterisks, those stars remind us that those entries are terminal. And those entries up here are non-terminal, okay? As long as they are played, the game keeps on being played. Okay, so this was the game and Gillette in 1957 said, look, this is a nice game. He said something about what the players can uh, achieve by stationary strategies, but he said, I don't know what the players can do here without stationary strategies. Note that this payoff function F is not tail measurable because it depends on, it is affected by what, by what happens in the first stages. For example, if in the first stage, the players play bottom left and afterwards they play top left, then the payoff is one because once the, uh, a player, the player one plays bottom, the game terminates. But if we change the action profile in the first period to top left, then the outcome is zero because the long run average of zeros is zero. So this pair function is not tail measurable. So if you think about, we want to solve the open problem, repeated games without tail measurable pair. Payoffs. Let's think about the simplest game that we can that do not have tail measurable payoffs. So we have two players. Yes. We have two actions to each player. Yes. Two of the entries are, are terminal, are absorbing, right? Once we, are, we play them, the game terminates. And only two entries are interesting. Only though in to those two entries, the game can evolve in an interesting way. So this is a very simple class of games. Um, so here, so this is why um, uh, we started uh, working about this class of games, the big match games. Okay, so, uh, so let's see this game, the big match with this payoff function F, which is, the limit of the average of the long run average payoffs if the if player one uh, always plays top what is the value of this game by the way why do we know that the value exists okay okay so a question does the value of this game exist? You can also write in the chat. I do see the chat. I have two uh, screens in front of me. Well, it's zero sum, right? Or constant sum. Yes, it is a zero sum game. And so indeed by Martin, 98, uh, the talk of Ron yesterday, this is a Blackwell game, two players, zero sum, uh, and therefore a finitely many actions, and therefore the value exists. So, so there is no issue about existence of the value as of 1998, okay? In 1957, it was still not known. But in 1998, we know that the value exists. Okay. So 
what how can i mean what is you this know value? you know that the value exists even before right yes we will get to that but at present what we know right uh, in uh, uh, in this summer school is only the results that we that we heard uh, in those three days and martin is the earlier result that allows us to deduce the existence of the value in this year uh, but indeed, in, as I said, in 1968, Blackwell and Ferguson solved this specific game. And afterwards, of course, we have uh, additional results. Uh, Elon Kohlberg uh, uh, extended it, and then uh, Abraham Neyman, together with Jean Francois Mertens, extended it to any two players uh, zero sum stochastic game. So we have existence results, but uh, again, what we heard. Uh, in this summer school is uh, Martin 1998. So player two, uh, she, can, she can guarantee one half very easily. Suppose that player two in every period plays half half, half left, half right, half right. I claim that by playing this strategy, player two guarantees one half. Why? Because if player one ever plays B, then with probability one half, we are absorb we are uh, the payoff will be one, and with probability one half, the payoff will be zero, so that the expected payoff will be half. Whereas if player one always play top, then the payoff will be the long run average payoff. Of, uh, but if player two plays half half, then by the low large numbers, the long run average payoff will converge to one half. So that uh, this stationary strategy guarantees an outcome of one half, whether player one ever plays B or whether she uh, always play T. So great, so we know that uh, player two can guarantee one half. What about player one? So I claim that player one, that for every strategy of player one, of player two, sorry, player one has a response that ensures that the payoff is at least one half. Those two together ensure that the value is one half. Those two claims. So why is this? Why can player one always respond by a strategy with a strategy that guarantees one half. So take some strategy of player two. And suppose that in some period, T, player two, she plays left with probability yt and y and r with probability one minus yt. Now, if yt is loud, is at least one half, then player one will play B in that period and will ensure an expected payoff of at least one half, right? Because YT is larger than one half. So if YT, whenever YT is larger than half, player one plays bottom and guarantees expected payoff of one half. So uh, in that case, uh, player one plays B, and if yt is smaller than one half, then players, player one plays top. In that case, if player, if yt is always smaller than one half, then one minus yt is at least, is always larger than one half. Therefore, in any stage uh, in which player one plays T, the expected payoff is at least one half, and then by the low large number, the long run average is at least one half. So in both cases, whatever happens, uh, the, uh, this response of player one guarantees a payoff of at least one half uh, to player one. Any questions? Okay, so uh, 
so uh, we know that uh, the value of this game is one half. But then it is interesting to see that player one cannot guarantee one half. Player one does not have a strategy that guarantees one half to any, against any strategy of player two. That is, uh, for every strategy of player one, player two has a response that lowers player one's payoff to below one half. Okay, and what is that? So, so suppose that the strategy of player one is to always play T. So against this stationary strategy, the response of player two will be always play L. In that case, the outcome is zero in every period and the long run average of zeros is zero. So the outcome will be zero. So a strategy of player one that always play T cannot be good. It is a bad strategy because player two has a response that lowers the payoff to zero. Otherwise, if the strategy of player one is not to always play top, it means that there is some finite sequence of actions of player two such that the, the, the play of player one will be top in the first T stages, zero, one, two, up to T minus one. And then in, in stage T, player one will play bottom with positive probability. Okay, so this is uh, the complementary case to always playing T. Okay, uh, if a strategy does not always play T, it means that after some history, it plays B with positive probability. So we take that shortest history after which it plays T with, it plays B with positive probability, and we call that shortest history A to zero up A to T minus one. And then suppose that this, that the strategy of player one it satisfied this property, then what will be the response of player two? Player two will play this sequence of strategies in the first T stages. And then in stage T, she will play right because in stage T, she knows that player one is going to play B with positive probability. So she will play right. And afterwards, if the game was not terminated, that it is if player one did not play B, then she will play half half afterwards. So what is the expected payoff? The first T stages does not affect the long run payoff. In stage T, there is a positive probability of being absorbed to zero. And afterwards, the payoff will be half. So overall, the expected payoff is strictly below half. So as we see, player one does not have a strategy that guarantees one half. Nevertheless, the value is one half. This means that player one has a strategy that guarantees one minus epsilon for every epsilon positive. And indeed, indeed this is uh, the result of Blackwell and Ferguson in 1968. Uh, and they prove that for every uh, integer M positive, player one has a strategy that guarantees an expected payoff of at least M divided by two M plus one. And the strategy of player one, it is written here, it is very simple. So player one counts the number of times until stage T uh, in which player two played left, this is LT, and the number of, style of stages before stage T in which player two played right. So this is R of T. And then player, uh, we calculate the difference RT minus LT. So this difference is known to uh, the players at the beginning of stage T. And then at stage T, player one plays B with probability, which is one over M plus K2 plus one squared. And focus focus, this strategy does the trick. 
it guarantees m over 2m plus 1. So the proof is not difficult. It is uh, by induction on, uh, on uh, anyway, it, it is by induction of T. Anyway, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, read the original paper by Blackwell and Ferguson. It's a very nice proof. Uh, and uh, what is the intuition behind the strategy? Suppose that player one, sorry, suppose that player two plays le left often. He plays left more than he plays right. In that case, LT is larger than RT, so that the difference is negative. Now, if player two plays left often, then player one would like to play B, so that she gets this one, which means that she would like to increase the probability by which she plays B. And indeed, if LT is larger than RT, then KT is negative, it is small, and then M, this difference is small. And so we divide by something which is small, so it becomes a high number. So the smaller KT, the higher the probability to play B. Okay. So uh, this is the intuition behind those, uh, this strategy, but somehow coming, coming up with this strategy and with those numbers, uh, this is something very impressive, I think. Okay, so this is the big match, the zero sum big match. Okay, by the way, what is the, oops, okay, what is the time? Um, I know. Okay, I don't know. I lost. It. Okay, so uh, so Six, sixty minutes. Sixty minutes. Sixty minutes. Good. So uh, so this was uh, uh, the big match, and now I would like to take a variation of the big match. Well, here instead of pair of one, it is written C. Okay. So here. The value, uh, this is a similar game, and uh, one can show the same as uh, Blackwell and Ferguson, that the value is C over one plus C. Uh, the intuition is that, uh, suppose that player, one, player two plays the stationary strategy C over one plus C. Uh, prob this probability, she plays L, and the probability one over one plus C, she plays right. In that case, the expected payoff, the expected stage payoff is C over one plus C, whether player one plays bottom or whether player one plays top. So the expected payoff is C over one plus C and therefore player, one, player two can guarantee C over one plus C. And similarly to what we've seen before for every strategy of player two, player one has a response that lowers, that, uh, that guarantees at least C over one plus C. Okay, so, uh, so we will need this game in the future. And now to non-zero sum games. Okay, to zero sum games, uh, um, Blackwell and Ferguson solved uh, the big match. And then when we have more complicated games, uh, stochastic games, Mertens and Neyman in 1981 proved the existence of the value. So uh, the interesting thing is what happens when the game is non-zero sum. So we are going to consider a non-zero sum version of the big match where um, we make only one change in the payoff function and we will see it now. So again, we denote by T star, the first stage in which player one plays B. If T star is finite, if player one plays B at some point, then the outcome is either one zero or zero one, depending on the action of player two at that stage, at stage T star. Okay, so the payoff is either one zero or zero one. The question is what happens when player one plays T or top always. 
In that case, the payoff function is no longer the limit of the averages of, of stage payoffs, but it is some function of the whole play of player two. So we have a function u, which is a function from the sequence, the infinite sequence of actions of player two, left, right to the power infinity, okay, to R2. And then the payoff will be the U function that depends only on the actions of player two. Because player one, she played always top. So there is nothing, uh, her actions are, are rather um, the same or constant. So the only thing that changes is the play of player two and the payoff depends on those infinite sequence of actions. I have a question. Yes. You are emphasizing now that the input of one of the players is constant, right? No, no, no. So e player one, she chooses top and bottom in every period. Yes, indeed. If she ever chooses bottom, then the payoff is either one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but in, in the third case, you, ask, yeah, you said in the third case where T star is infinite. Yeah. Um, the input of uh, play one, I guess it is, 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 is constant. Yeah, because okay. in that case, it means that player yes. one always played the top. Yes, indeed. But wasn't this already the case two slides ago? Yeah. Yes. Because th there you didn't emphasize it. That's true. You're absolutely correct. I didn't, and now I do. Yeah, <laughs> why? Yes, yes, you are absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if this was uh, confusing my uh, emphasis, then forget it. Oh. Okay, I apologize, yeah. Hey, Ron? Yes. Do you assume that the function, that the game is a constant sum game or zero sum game? No, I do not. If it is a constant sum game, it is a zero sum game, and then we have uh, Martin, right? Martin tells us that in such a game, zero sum, we have a value. Okay. So, I, so this function, this U function is not zero sum, not constant sum. It is some general function. It will be bounded and Borel measurable and tail measurable but it will be not zero sum. Okay? Okay. Okay, so this is our game. And the question is whether this game has an, equili an epsilon equilibrium for every epsilon. Okay, and uh, it, as far as I know, uh, when the COVID started, it was still not known. And our theorem is that if you is uh, tail measurable, bounded and Borel measurable, then the game admits an epsilon equilibrium. And this is what I would like to show you today. And then I will talk about extensions because I, I guess that everyone see here that, um, that this is a very restricted class of games and we would like to know uh, how far we can, uh, we can go. So I'll tell you that I do not have a counter example for a game without epsilon equilibria, finitely many uh, actions, finitely many players, uh, Borel measurable payoffs and bounded payoffs, so that the sky is the limit. But the only question is how closer to the sky we can get. I mean, we personally, not we as a humanity in the future. Okay. So let's uh, let's uh, see what uh, uh, how we can uh, prove that uh, theorem. So what I do from now on is a proof. Let us denote by VI the value of the zero sum game with the payoffs of player I, where player I is the maximizer 
and the other player is the minimizer. Okay, so this uh, is the max min value of player i or the min max value of player i. This is a zero sum game. So uh, the min max value and the max min value are the same. Okay, so vi, this is an amount that player i can guarantee in the game. And by Martin, we know that it exists. Uh, also, uh, as uh, already mentioned by Galit and Janos, since the pair function is u is tail measurable, this vi is independent of the position that we are, provided we've not been absorbed so far. So provided player one only played t in the past, then the mean max value is the same. Is the same as the, the min max value in the continuation game is the same as the min max value in the original game, in the original posi uh, starting position. And this is the tail measurability of u. Moreover, as uh, both Galit and Janos said, uh, and also uh, Ron, I'm not sure whether you mentioned it or not in your talk, for every delta, player I has a subgame perfect delta max min strategy. So a, max, a delta max min strategy is a strategy that guarantees an expected payoff of the min max value minus delta. Okay, a subgame perfect such strategy is one that guarantees this expected payoff after every position in all subgames. But of course, in all subgames in which the play has not been terminated yet. So in all subgames in which player one so far only played T. So we have such a max min strategy, sigma i delta. Okay, so this is what we will need to construct an equilibrium, an epsilon equilibrium in this class of games. So let us uh, make a few simple observations. First, I claim that the min max value of player one is at least zero. Why is that? Because player one can guarantee zero by playing bottom. She plays bottom and she gets either one or zero. So her min max value is at least zero. Okay. So uh, this is the first trivial observation. A second trivial observation is that the min max value of player two is at most one. Why is that? Because player two by playing bottom she ensures that the payoff of player two is at most one. It is either zero or one. So player one can always ensure that player two's payoff is at most one. Okay, so we bounded V1 and V2 from each from some direction. Now let's consider the case where V1 is strictly larger than one. I claim that this case is easy as well. Why? Suppose that V1 is larger than one. Well, if player one ever plays B, her payoff is at most one. So here, if her min max value is strictly larger than one, it means that she never plays B in an optimal strategy. She always plays T. But if she always plays T, then the, the max mean will depend on, the, I mean, whatever player two plays. This implies that U, the function U, must be for player two. So here I miss uh, an index one. So the payoff of player one under U is always strictly larger than one. Okay, the function u for player one is strictly higher than one. Okay, because the min max value of player one is strictly higher than one, 
and if player one ever plays B, her payoff is at most one, so that the only way for her to guarantee one, to guarantee more than one, is by always playing T. So the function U1 is strictly higher than one. So what will be an epsilon equilibrium? An epsilon equilibrium will be player one will always play T. In that case, she guarantees that her payoff is higher than one and she has no reason to deviate because by deviating and playing B, she will get at most one. Now, what about player two? Player two is free to choose whatever she wants because player one will always play T. So player two will play that sequence of actions that maximizes her payoff U2 up to epsilon. And that's it. And then she cannot, pro she cannot uh, profit more than epsilon by deviating because she already plays a sequence of actions that maximizes her payoff. Questions about this simple case. Okay, so we handled another simple case. And then uh, the last simple case that we will handle is the case where V1 is equal to one and V2 is at most zero. Ron, do you have a question? No. Okay, so suppose that V1, the, va the min max value of, of player one is one, the min max value of player two is non positive. In that case, the players will be rather happy to get one zero, right? Player one is happy to get one because her min max value is one. Player two will be happy to get zero because her min max value is non-positive. So zero is above her min max value. And then what will be uh, an epsilon equilibrium? So player one will play one minus epsilon epsilon stationary and player two will play always left. So under this stationary strategy, the game will eventually, uh, player one will eventually play bottom and the payoff will be one zero. Can anyone profit by deviating? So player one essentially can profit by deviating because maybe you, the function you, of L, 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 L is very high for player one. So we should, uh, in that case, we want to ensure that player one does not deviate and always play top. But this is easy. Player two simply checks whether the game, will, whether player one played B after one million periods. Okay, after one million periods, player one should have played B with high probability. Okay, uh, I mean, take 1 million to be one over epsilon squared. So, uh, and then if player one did not play B in the first 1 million stages, then player two switches to a punishment strategy against player one and reduces their payoff to one. So that by such a threat of punishment, uh, player two can ensure that player one does not profit by not playing B. Can player two profit by deviating to right? Well, such a deviation is immediately detected. She should have played left always, and she deviates to right. With probability one minus epsilon, the game does not terminate and then she can be punished by the min max value, which is negative, non-positive at most zero. And since anyway, she gets zero, it means that she cannot profit much by DV. So such a strategy is uh, an approximate uh, equilibrium, an epsilon equilibrium for a proper epsilon. So those are two simple cases that we could solve. And now, uh, Il Ilana, I have a question. Uh, yes. The fact that V2 is uh, at most zero, doesn't it mean that 
in uh, as long as player one plays top, the payoff of player two must be at most zero. Yes, I think so. Yeah. So TL and TR always give uh, zero or less to Mr. Two, right? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, it, it maybe U2, uh, maybe U2 of LLL can be positive, but the rest, yes, indeed should be uh, zero. Ah, yeah, there are no stage payoffs. Okay, I forgot that. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. That's what makes it. Elon? Ken. Yeah. For, for this case, V1 equals 1, V2 is less than or equal to zero. Uh, can't you start with playing uh, BL in the first period for sure? And if it's not played, then moving to punishment? No. Suppose that the players play. Uh, BL in the first period, then player two is better off deviating to right. You're, you're right, you're right, yes. I forget. Yeah. So player one should hide okay. the stage. Okay. No, 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 I want to, uh, to explain it to the others. Um, uh, but this is why we play one minus epsilon epsilon and not bottom left. Okay. So what are the remaining cases? So there are two remaining cases uh, that will be interesting. And we uh, divide them according to whether, oops, um, according to whether the sum of V1 plus V2 is above one, strictly above one, or at most one. Okay. Uh, now in the first case that V1 plus V2 is at most one, then I claim that V1 is necessarily less than one. Why is that? This is because if the sum of V1 and V2 is at most one, and V1, uh, we, we already handled the case that V1 is larger than one. So we don't have to handle that. So suppose that V1 is equal to one, if V1 is equal to one, it means that V2 is non-positive. And we handle this case already. So that in this case, V1 plus V2 is at most one, we can also assume that V1 is strictly below one. We will need it. And therefore I emphasize it, uh, that, we, that uh, we can assume that V1 is smaller than one. So those are the two cases that we still need to handle. Let's handle them. So we start with the first case. V1 is strictly less than one and V1 plus V2 is at most one. In that case, the players will be happy to get V1 and one minus V1. Okay, player one gets at least her mean max value. We, we, sorry, player one gets her mean max value, and player two gets more than her, her mean max value, at least her mean max value, because V2 is smaller than one minus V1. So if the outcome will be one minus V1, player two is happy. Okay. So the players, uh, we will devise an epsilon equilibrium in which the players get V1, one minus V1. And for that, we use the original big match of Blackwell and Ferguson, where here, I do not stick one. Uh, the payoff here is C, where C is V1 over one minus V1. Why do I want to have C equal to V1 over one minus V1? This is because I want the value of this game to be equal to V1. So from the point of view of player one, the original game where his value is V1 and this game where the value is V1 is the same. So again, we plug in here C, the payoff C, and now this is a stage payoff. 
because this is the Blackwell and Ferguson big match where we have stage payoffs. So the stage payoff here is C. We know that the value of this game is C over one plus C. I would like the value to be equal to V1. And therefore I have to plug in C, V1 over one minus V1. And so that this is well defined, I need V1 to be strictly less than one. Okay, and therefore I needed this case that V1 is strictly less than one, it's between zero and one. Um, okay, so now how can we get, how can we devise a strategy in which V1, uh, the players get V1, V1 minus V1? Well, this is by, by telling player two to play with probability V1 left and with probability one minus V1 right. Okay, so player one plays a stationary strategy. Player two also plays a stationary strategy, one minus epsilon epsilon. Now, if the players play this strategy profile, stationary strategy profile, eventually the game terminates because eventually player one plays B and the expected payoff will be V1, one minus V1. Can the players profit by deviating? So the answer is no. Player one, oh, yes, but we will see how. What happens with player one? Player one, the only way she can deviate uh, in a meaningful way is by always playing top. Because if she ever plays bottom, well, the game terminates and the payoff is V1 minus one minus V1. So the only way she can deviate is by never playing top, by never playing bottom, that is always playing top. But then, uh, as we did before, after in stage one million, if the game, if player one did not play bottom yet, then with high probability she uh, deviated, and then player two starts punishing player one at her min max level V1. So such a deviation is not profitable. What happens with player two? So player two, why should she play V1 minus V1? Minus V1? She's better off playing right more often. So this means that player one should monitor the actions of player two and should ensure that player two roughly plays V1 one minus V1. Okay, she does a statistical test that checks whether the empirical frequency of actions of player two is, uh, is uh, what V1 minus V1. And if this frequency differs by much from V1 minus one minus V1, player one starts punishing player two. So this is the way to, to, uh, to transform the stationary strategy profile into an epsilon equilibrium. So this technique is uh, standard in stochastic games. And uh, okay, so we, so far uh, I didn't do much. Those are standard tools. The last case is the case that needs new ideas. And this is the case that we will do now. So here, the interesting case is that when the sum of min max values is more than one. In that case, the players do not want to end up here in those two payoffs because the sum of those two pair of series one, and uh, they can do each one by itself, can, can do V1 and V2, and their sum is more than one. So essentially in an equilibrium, player one will have to, to play top always on the, on the equilibrium path. Okay, so let's see uh, what we do here. So suppose without loss of generality that the function u has finite range. Okay, since we are talking about an epsilon equilibrium, we can round the payoffs out up to the closest epsilon and we only add small noise. So we do not really affect uh, the fact that the epsilon equilibrium property. 
and uh, uh, we choose lambda to be uh, a positive number sufficiently small such that uh, one plus two lambda is still less than V1 plus V2. So delta is much smaller than the difference between V1 plus V2 and one. And now we choose a subgame perfect delta maximum strategy for player two, okay? Where delta is this delta. We will need it actually to be even smaller later, but, uh, but uh, anyway, so we choose a subgame perfect delta maximum strategy. Now, what happens when player two plays, plays this strategy? Her payoff is at least V2 minus delta, right? Because this is a maximum strategy. It guarantees V2 minus delta after a, all positions in which player one only played the top. What is the expected payoff of player one? under when player one plays always top and player two plays sigma. I claim that this expected payoff is at least V1. Why? Okay, and this is an important issue. Why does this sigma two, which is good to player two, is also good to player one? So let's see why. So sigma two, guarantees V2 minus delta at every position, right? So let's look at this, strat at, uh, this game. What is the probability that Sigma two assigns to R at a given position? I claim that this probability must be at least V2 minus delta. I claim that the strategy sigma two delta after every history in which player one always played top plays right with probability at least V2 minus delta. Why? Because this strategy guarantees V2 minus delta at this history. In particular, it guarantees V2 minus delta if player one plays bottom. But if player one plays bottom, what is the payoff of player two? It is the probability that she plays right. Which means that the probability she plays right should be at least V2 minus delta. Okay. So we know that the probability of right is at least V2 minus delta. So what is the probability of left? Well, the probability of left is at most one minus V2 plus Delta. Okay, the sum of probabilities is one. So if this probability or the probability of right is at least V2 minus Delta, the probability of left is at most V2, if it is at most one minus V2 plus Delta. But we know that V1 plus V2 is larger than one plus two delta. So one minus V2 is smaller than V1, right? So this probability is smaller. No, this is not a good color. It is smaller than V1 minus delta, agreed? So the probability that player two plays left is at most V1 minus delta. So suppose that player two plays this strategy, sigma two delta. Now player one can guarantee, has a response that guarantees the max mean, right? His value, player one can guarantee his value against sigma two delta. What will happen if player one plays B? Well, she will get the probability of left, which is smaller than V1 minus Delta. It is smaller than V1. 
So by playing B against sigma two delta, after every history at every position, player one gets a low payoff below her min max. So if she always played top, she gets at least her min max. Okay? So this strategy, this, this um, max min strategy of player two, it guarantees high payoff to player two and also to player one. Okay? And this is uh, the heart of the argument. I mean, we will have additional arguments, um, but now we have a suggestion for an epsilon equilibrium, right? Um, what is the candidate of an, uh, of an equilibrium? The candidate is player one always plays T, player two follows sigma two delta. And then player one cannot profit by deviating. And player two gets more than her min max. Is this an uh, epsilon equilibrium, a two delta equilibrium, a something equilibrium? This is a question to the audience. I, I guess it is, right? Because player one cannot uh, gain by deviating because then it gets less. That's true. Player one cannot gain by deviating. And uh, player two can't either because if she plays left too often, then uh, she will be punished. So, oh, so player one will monitor player two and then will build the punishment. So, indeed, uh, we must ensure that player two plays sigma two delta. Sigma two delta may involve randomization. But then uh, the payoff is not a stage payoff. The payoff is a function of the whole play. That's and true. maybe the payoff depends crucially on actions of player two that are played in a very sparse sequence of times in stages without two to the power k. And the, the weight of those, uh, the, the frequency of those stages might be, might be uh, very rare. And therefore it might be difficult to make statistical tests to check whether player two follows sigma two delta. Okay? I, I do not say it is not possible. I say, I do not know how to do that. If it is possible, I thought about it a little bit. I didn't see whether you can, we can have countably many statistical tests that check whether player two follows the strategy or not. Maybe it is possible. I'm not, I do not know. In any case, uh, the problem is that player two uh, may prefer one play path over another play path in the support of his strategy. And maybe we cannot uh, uh, check that statistically. Okay, so we have to refine our, our construction. Yes, a question? You know, so, sorry, I have a question. Maybe I take you back a little bit. So if yeah. you want, you can uh, ignore my question. I'm just puzzled about, you wrote that uh, if player one plays T and player two plays sigma two delta, then the payoff for player one, the expected payoff for player one is at least V1. Yes. And I don't see why. Okay. Why is... <laughs> okay. So sigma two delta plays right with probability at least V2 minus delta in every position. Yes. Okay. This means that it plays left with probability at most one minus V2 plus delta. Okay. Now, because V1 plus V2 is larger than one, it is larger than one plus two delta, it follows that this probability is smaller than V1 minus delta. Okay. okay. Suppose that now player one plays bottom. What will be her payoff? Her payoff will be the probability that player two plays left, which is at most V1 minus delta. 
Okay. Okay. So now we know that player one has a response against sigma two delta that guarantees at least V1. What? What is the mean max value? The mean max value, or at least V1 minus epsilon. For any epsilon, she has a, a strategy that guarantees at least V1 minus epsilon. Is that true? But it's the min max of player two. No, 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 V1? V1 is the min max of player one. So player one against any strategy of player two, player one has a response that guarantees for her V1. Okay. Okay, so against sigma two delta, player one has a response that guarantees more, at least V1. Right. Okay, what is this response? It cannot involve playing back B because playing B gives her at most V1 minus delta. Okay. So it must be always playing T. Okay, so T is the best response yes. for player one to sigma two delta. Exactly. The okay. stationary strategy T is the best response of player one against sigma two delta. Hence, it, uh, it, uh, the payoff is at least V1. And moreover, by deviating to B at any position, player one loses. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, but this is still not an equilibrium because player two, uh, her, uh, her play here is, is uh, random, and therefore she might prefer one play path to another play path. Okay. So here we are going uh, uh, now to uh, use, uh, uh, okay, also uh, tell me somebody in a moment. So consider now the expected payoff of player, the expected payoff given the, this candidate that we have, T and sigma two delta, given the history at stage T. Okay, so given the play up to stage T, we consider this expectation, this conditional expectation. Now this expectation, this is a random variable. It is a martingale because an expectation of a function given an increasing filtration, this is a martingale that converges to the function. So we know that the expected payoff of the players given the information given the history up to period T, this is a martingale that converges to U1, U2, to the payoff function U. Now we assumed that the function U has a finite range. This means that there is a vector W in R2, there is a payoff vector, which is more than the mean max value to both players. And there is a position P in which player two only play, player one only played T such that the, uh, the probability that uh, U1 and U2 are equal to this W given P is higher than one minus delta. Okay, so at a far enough uh, uh, point in time we there is a history after which we know that we are close to the limit with high probability. Uh, Elon, Elon, a question. Isn't it rather that uh, it's this payoff or better payoffs even, right? It is this payoff. It is exactly W1 and W2. Okay, because if I randomize, uh, why couldn't it be uh, two or three good payoffs for everybody? You are absolutely correct that maybe in, in, in stage 100, you randomize and you still don't know your outcome. But if you go far enough into the future, you know your outcome. 
Why? Is this the tail measurability or, or why do you know this? I don't think so. I think this is just measurability, Borel measurability. Because we have here the expected, the expected payoff and we know that it converges point-wise and with probability to U. Which means that if we go far, suppose that uh, take some W uh, here in the range, so you know that if you go far enough into the future, you know that you are close to W, which means that afterwards with high probability, uh, the payoff will be W. So this is not tail measurability, I think. I think it's Borel measurability. Ah, because you, you, if you have too often another payoff or too likely another payoff, you will not get the right average anymore. That's the reason. Yeah. Ah, okay, now I understand. Thanks. I think Lev is zero or low is very good to look at for this. Yeah. Okay, so we, are, we, can, uh, we can use uh, the, the, the zero one low, the multi convergence theorem. They are all, uh, they will all deliver it. Is it then, just the fact that uh, the, the multi game converges on shooting? I think so. I mean, this is uh, the argument that I uh, wanted to, uh, to do here, uh, the Martingale Convergence Theorem. But uh, if uh, the V01 law is uh, easier to sum, then fine. But the point is that since the payoff function is Borel measurable, then if we look far enough into the future, then we know with high probability what will be the payoff. And so we have a new candidate for an equilibrium, which is again, player one plays T. Now player two follows Sigma two until uh, the lengthy uh, for lengthy uh, positions. And then essentially, uh, okay, for lengthy stages, the length of the position P and afterwards, she forgets past play and she follows sigma two delta as if P occurred. Here I use tail measurability. Okay, so, so at period, once the position, once we are at the length of P, we start playing as if P occurred. This means that our payoff will high probability will be W. Agreed? So no, no, I, I, uh, I'm not sure I follow. So there is some position P. Yeah. Uh, after which we know that we are close to the target. Yeah. But that P might not be realized. It might not be realized. We might, uh, maybe a different uh, uh, yes. history is realized. Yeah. So we only wait for the length of P. Yes. And then we play according to sigma two uh, delta as if P occurred. Exactly, as if P occurred. But since oh. P is not tail measurable, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, we get the payoff as if P occurred. Okay. okay. So, and therefore the payoff will be with high probability, it will be W. Okay? okay. Is this an epsilon equilibrium? Same problem as before. Yes, indeed, continue. indeed, the same problem as before. Indeed, with high probability, the payoff will be W. But with low probability, it might be something higher than W, and player two is the one who controls the payoff. So she can make the game, uh, she can make the play such that the payoff is strictly higher than W2, and she can win. She can profit. So it is still the same problem. 
The fact that with high probability we get W2 does not mean that this is a, that player two cannot profit by deviating. So we need one more thing, one more step to transform this strategy into an equilibrium. Right? We would like to ensure that player two does not do that. That player two does not play in such a way that the payoff will be not W2. And how would we do that? Well, we, uh, we go back to uh, Galitz, uh, to Galitz talk about regularity. And here we don't need the regularity of the mean max, but just regularity of measures that uh, Iran already mentioned. Okay. So we consider the set of all play paths in which the payoff is W and that they extend P. And we know now uh, this, uh, if the players follow T and sigma two, and this is not the original sigma two delta, but given T. So uh, we uh, condition on T. Then A has, uh, uh, so this set, uh, it has some probability, more than one minus delta, but then we can, uh, we can find a closed subset A of this set whose probability is at least one minus two delta. Okay? So we find a closed subset. On this closed subset, the payoff is exactly W, always. And the measure of this, uh, of this subset is at least one minus two delta. Since this set is closed, its U, its, its uh, complement is open. So which means that it is a union, a, an open set is a union of basic open sets. And here a basic open set is uh, the set that is defined by a position. Everything that, uh, that uh, extends some position. And, uh, and now what will be our statistical test? We do not want player two to get outside A, right? We ask pl the players to play T and sigma two delta, okay? The same strategy as before. We have the same strategy as here. But now, if, if the play enters the complement of A, then we punish player two. Now this happens with small probability, probability at most two delta. So punishment occurs with probability smaller than two delta, but on A player two cannot deviate because the payoff is always W. And this is an, an epsilon equilibrium. Questions? Yeah, what, what about the following strategy? Uh, player two, okay. Uh, I mean, how can player one ever punish? I mean, player one can only, the only punishment you can think of is player one blank bottom, right? Because that's the only deviation he has. Yeah. Right? So, so then uh, couldn't I, and let's suppose V2 is not one, it's smaller than one, okay? And now I'm player two and I have the following idea. Ah, I take care that I get out of A and the first time I get out of A, I play right from then on. And then I know player one needs to punish me and then I get a one. The punishment but, is play dependent. But maybe- Yes, but now I'm, I, could, I could, you know, I could detect when I'm first out of A, right? When I first left A. Oh, you, you don't switch to a punishment with an action at that very instant moment. You're ah, okay. moving to a punishment that is play dependent. So you wouldn't know where, when I'm punishing you, when I'm switching to what? Because you, you only do it with small probability. Yeah, 
you will decide exactly when, depending on the play of the other. Okay, but then I always play right, and then? Yeah, Martin, it can be that you too, if right, 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 is low. No, but, but if you always play right under this condition that V2 is less than one, yes? Then necessarily U2 of R, R, R is low. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, deviating to always R is not necessarily a good thing. Indeed, player one will not play bottom, but if he plays top, maybe your payoff as player two is very low. Okay, so, so the, the, you know, the, the, the way player one punishes has to be very careful, right? Otherwise I could, you know, trick him in this simple way that I just... Yes, you know. yes, yes. The way to punish, essentially we are in a zero-sum game, so we are back in Martin's 98 paper, and then we do whatever Martin tells us, which is very complicated. Yes. Uh... One comment just for my understanding. I think I could have followed if I think that epsilon, the epsilon equilibrium we are looking is much less than delta, but sometimes you refer to epsilon equals delta. And then I think there were a few points that I was not sure that I... So you should think of delta as much smaller than epsilon. Epsilon much smaller than delta. No, the other way around. The other delta way. is much smaller than epsilon. Delta is much smaller. Okay. Delta is much smaller. So the the new idea no. here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes, but but delta is much smaller. Then there was some slide that you showed that when player one switches to bottom. Uh, then he was losing delta and delta is much smaller. It is, would be still an epsilon equilibrium. So it wouldn't violate. So there I was confused. Okay, so maybe I used the uh, epsilon uh, several times. Not I mean, playing one minus epsilon epsilon, I should have uh, wrote one minus delta delta. That would have been better. Uh, and, uh, but, so I wasn't careful about when I used epsilon. Okay, okay. So. The spirit I understood. I couldn't uh, match all the epsilons and the delta. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the new, the new, idea, the new thing here that I that I see is the use of uh, regularity of measures to construct uh, a, a statistical test. And this is something I don't know. Merale, have you seen it in the past? At least I haven't. Sorry, Elon. So oh, I said I said no. Yeah, don't. Okay, so I don't remember that. And uh, uh, you, you know, you you should explore it a little more, and maybe maybe even uh, just emphasizing that in a separate paper or in that paper, more, making statistical tests that are based on the uh, regularity. Mm -hmm. So sorry, Alan. So, so yeah. is it also true that, uh, but is also new somehow? Perhaps it is not new that uh, your punishment is somehow uh, stochastic. So, so if I remember, in many cases we we punish something if we see okay he he did something wrong, but he, here you don't say that. You say that with high probability, certain probability, you say that it is wrong. He mm -hmm. did something wrong, and then you already punish. Yeah. So this, this is, is so this is not a usual punishment. So this is uh, this is a, you know, this is a stochastic punishment. Let me say, but I don't know what the good uh, good term for it. Yeah, in the literature of stochastic games, it is common to uh, to make such statistical tests that uh, with some probability they catch you even if you are honest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I didn't say that before. This is a joint work with uh, Galit and uh, Janos and Arkady. So, uh, and what else? Um, so open problems. So this class of games is uh, very, uh, very uh, 
restricted, as I said. And now we would like to uh, extend this uh, result. So one extension is to drop the tail measurability condition on U. I think that this will be, uh, this is uh, the first, oh, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. Um, so the first uh, extension uh, to drop uh, tail measurability, and that will be the first step into really understanding repeated game without uh, tail measurable pairs, just Borel measurable. Uh, I think this is uh, this will be a nice uh, problem. Another uh, another uh, extension is what happens when the game is a little bit more complicated, a big match game. Suppose that uh, we have more than two by two, and may maybe the entries we have more absorbing entries, so they are no not uh, as before. Uh, and then we have uh, some pair function u, which is uh, from the collection of non-asterisks, non-asterisks uh, entries to the power infinity to R2. Again, this is the class of absorbing games. To those of you who are familiar with the literature on, uh, on stochastic games, uh, and we would like to say, okay, U is still tail measurable, but the game is more complicated. The, the underlying one-shot game is more complicated. Uh, do we have the, uh, an epsilon equilibrium here still with two players? So Elon, this is, how is this different from VA because of this more general utility function on non, non absorbed plays, right? Yeah, you have more entries, uh, right? More entries. No, no. The question, the question is, how is it different from VA? It dif uh, why yeah. is it different from VA because of the more general functions? Yeah. So Nicola VA assumed that U is the limit, the limb soup of average payoffs. Okay. So this is one case. This is a special case. So. The, the payoff function that Nicola studied is a special case of this more general result. Uh, special and more general, because in the other sense, it's not only the proof is not only for the limb soup, but it's kind of uniform also, uniform and limb soup. So it's a stronger result yeah. on, uh, on a more... Uh, now, my, my question is when you go to absorbing game, I, th I think, you know, you put for the big match was a kind of conditioning on big one and big yeah? And uh, different cases for different V1, ranges of V1 and V2, the individual rational levels. Uh, I think probably the, the first step in order to move to the absorbing state, uh, general absorbing states will be to try to rethink of your proof and try to see if you could do it without these cases. Yeah. One well, of all V1, V2. You are absolutely correct. And actually we already did it. So, uh, so indeed uh, you, can, uh, you can somehow uh, put the, the, the cases together. I mean, still you have, uh, you have several cases. Because actually, um, if we have to compare this result to the literature, I will compare it to the paper by Vriesen Teichmann, the PhD of uh, uh, Frank Teichmann in 89, who studied this game, uh, this absorbing game, two player, but with the limb soup of average payoffs, to prove the existence of an epsilon equilibrium. And uh, in the Vries Teichmann paper, we have three cases, and also uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, general tail measurable payoffs, we have a little bit more than three cases, but we can do that. Okay, so this case was done. And then the next extension was that uh, Eran Schmaya, I think, uh, already mentioned today, would be for, uh, which, uh, which will be the second extension that they have here for two-player non-zero-sum stochastic games with finitely many states and actions. 
and uh, but here still the payoffs are bounded, Borel uh, measurable and tail measurable. This would be the extension of Nicola Vie. Uh, I We have a proof for that. So we have a candidate of a proof. Uh, we still have to verify it, but uh, so this is uh, still under maybe. So we may be here. Uh, and then again, the answer, the question would be whether we can drop the measurable altogether. And that's it. So this is what I wanted to uh, show uh, in this talk. Thank you, Elon. Uh, yeah. So if there are no more questions, I will uh, pass the, uh, the... I have another question. Yeah. But I want to give some uh, space for others to ask questions. But yeah. In, when, when I have, yeah, I have one more question. And um, you know, there is this uh, thing that Bob Simon was uh, obsessed with, right? And I think you mentioned it, uh, you know, stochastic games. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. you know, with, with this, uh, you know, average payoffs or rim soup of averages and more than four players find many states, find many actions. Is there anything new? I mean, do we know more? Only looking at absorbing games or something, is there more? So unfortunately not, or at least as far as I know, in the stochastic games with, uh, with uh, many players, we still don't, uh, don't have uh, existence of equilibrium or a counter example, as Bob Simon tries to find. Not even with, you know, 325 play, play, players or something, nothing. Yeah, nothing. Um, we do have results on correlated equilibrium, on various types of correlated equilibrium, but uh, not on Nash equilibrium. Okay. okay. Uh, is there any, I don't know, in, in the book you're writing, do you put references for this kind of things? Uh, so the book on, uh, on Borel games, no, but the book, uh, I do write a book on stochastic games. Uh, which oh, okay. actually is going to be sent uh, next week to the publisher. Could, could I have a draft then? Of course, it is on my website. Ah, okay. Uh, free for okay. use. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, in there I do uh, mention, uh, I do give uh, uh, references. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, um, sure. Thanks for organizing this. This was wonderful. Thank you I, for I, the um, organizers and for the, all the speakers. Really uh, very clear lectures very systematic, both the individual lectures and the structure of the work. So really, thank you. Thank you again.